Hello everybody. Uh, we will continue our discussion on the camera, how the image is formed, uh, especially the geometric aspects of image formation process this week. Uh, last week, I think we have looked at this picture, uh, camera obscura. Uh, we say that a, a, a box, a dark box, a, a closed box doesn't receive any light from outside world other than the small pinhole in front of it. Okay, it is it is basically a camera. It forms an uh, uh, it forms the image of the outside world on the back wall upside down. Okay, and uh, this was known to uh, people long time ago, uh, as far as Aristotle. Okay, and we have we we told I told you that uh, we have these kind of inventions. These are practical uh, tools that are used that were used uh, during the day, especially this one. People were using this uh, pinhole camera to make drawings of real uh, objects, large objects, especially like uh, this one. Okay, so uh, we said that. How about the aperture size? I mean, should I make the aperture very, very small? Because remember, uh, I asked you this question, I guess, last week. Uh, out of the infinitely many light rays reflected from this point, only a bunch of light rays passes through this hole. Pass through this hole, okay? That's, that's what we said. And these 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 light rays hit at the, the end of the box like that, a small disk, circle of confusion. Okay, so if I make this hole larger, the image would get blurry, right? It would get blurred. That's what happens. So the logical thing is make this hole smaller. If I make this hole smaller, okay. Uh, if I if I make this hole smaller, then only one light ray will pass through, and my image will be very very sharp. That's what that's what I assume. But that doesn't happen. Why? Because let's look at this one. If the hole is two millimeters wide, this is what I see. One millimeter, I am getting sharper. Zero point six sharper. 0 0.35 very very sharp okay then let's go on let's let's make it even even smaller make it 0 0.15 no it is not better 0 0.07 it is not bad right it is getting worse so there is an optimal point so what is the reason why i am getting uh, uh, less focus images because our theory of the light travels along a line just a, it, it looks like, I mean, what we are assuming is that the photon, a, a, a smallest particle of light, okay, a single photon is very, very small, okay, and unla unless my uh, hole is not smaller than the photon itself, I should be fine, doesn't work, because uh, our theory of light traveling in a, on, a, 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 on a straight line does not hold in this case. It is not a perfectly valid theory. It works at, to some degree, but uh, to explain the whole light behavior, it doesn't. It doesn't work. You know these. You know this. Uh, I think you know these experiments. Let's say. Let's say. Let's say uh, in a in a water tank. I have this kind of a uh, I have this kind of a wall. There are two holes in it, right? And then I have a, a source of wave. I am making these kind of waves, right? So these waves go through. So what I am expecting is these waves will go through and continue like that, right? And they uh, and it will do the same thing that it doesn't happen that way it looks like i am doing this another and they will start interfering with each other okay so the waves they don't 
exactly propagate uh, on a straight line they have a different structure so these are the these are the interference of the uh, waves and these kind of phenomena are happening here too when i make the light uh, the, the the hole even smaller so that doesn't that doesn't work so i cannot make that hole a lot smaller besides i don't want to do that because if i make this hole a lot smaller a lot smaller i am not going to gather enough light uh, to make my uh, exposure in a reasonable amount of time i have to hold a lot that's what we said uh, last time that's why people said that no let's not do that let's use a lens thin lens so make this a box like that and make a large hole in front of it and put a thin lens what is the rule of thin lens thin lens says that okay all the light rays coming from a single point will be focused on a single point so if i put a film on this uh, uh, convert point of uh, here then i will get a focused image of this point but i am not going to get the focused image of this point and blue point there because why because as i tried to draw last time okay so these will go these will go they will try to they will try to do this so their point of uh, their point of intersection will be the uh, blue point and that will be out of my image plane so there is a although i can gather lots of light it's much better than a small hole i have this focusing problem now okay that's a focusing problem i think last time we were doing this last time we were doing this and last time i think somebody asked question about uh, can we use this effect to guess the can we use this effect to guess the depth of an object from the camera the answer was yes it was called depth from focus or depth from defocus and it's an active area of computer computer vision and uh, and and some of the cameras they use this idea to make a focused image of of a scene okay so what you need to do is what you need to do is i know i know i know okay uh, since i know the thin lens law one over f is one over one over object plus one over image so my object is this far my image is this far okay so that's the that's the relationship between the distances so i know this part because this is my camera i know the distance between the lens and the film i don't know the o i know f well in that case in that case i will find on my image the focus parts of the image and i will say that these pixels whatever caused these pixels to happen they are this far away from my camera okay good we don't use the lenses like this we don't use the lenses like that okay we use lenses like this okay we put an aperture so there is a there is a there is a curtain in front of or uh, behind the lens okay it doesn't allow all the light pass through only the light within the aperture aperture radius will pass through and will 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 focus on that point okay so aperture is a part of the standard lenses the nice thing is i can adjust the size of the aperture i can make it larger or smaller okay i can make it larger or smaller if i make this very very small like that let's say my aperture is like this very very small what's going to happen is only only this much light 
will pass through, right? Very, very small amount of light will pass through compared to the original size of original D. Okay, so in effect, this is this is like a pinhole camera, right? So I can, if I like, I can make my lens camera system behave like a pinhole camera if I like to. Okay, well, sometimes I want, I may want to do that because why? Be, because if I have a pinhole camera, I don't have the focusing problem. I don't have the focusing problem. If I have enough light, I can maybe use the uh, uh, pinhole, pinhole, uh, the, 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 the lens based pin. I can use the pinhole idea on a lens based system. Okay, good. Uh, this is the equation that we talked about last time. I have an object here. The image of object will form here. My focal length. Okay. And uh, DO and DI object distance, image distance. The, if I add the inverse of them, I get the inverse of the focal length. So what is the focal length? Focal length is the curvature of, directly proportional to the curvature of the lens. Lenses are, uh, lenses are spherical. So by lenses are formed by cutting the, uh, the size of the spheres. Okay. Selman, you have a question? You ask me your question using your microphone. I am listening, Selman. Is my speaker turned off? No, I can hear you. I cannot hear you, Selman. He wrote a message conversation. I cannot read it. What did he write? His question is, if the hole is large on pinhole cam camera, we have many focus points. We will have blurriness, blurriness because of Distortion right, but if it is small, we have blur, blurrina, blurriness, sorry, because of having less sample from the real life. Well, if you have a larger aperture, if the lens is large, okay, the in focus areas will be very nice. Let me show you one example. Okay, maybe. This, thank you, Shayda, by the way. I don't know why Selma is not asking his question. So uh, this is a real life image, the same lens system. In the above one, the aperture is large. And this is the effect what I am getting from that uh, camera system. As you see, the, the flowers are nicely focused. They are very sharp, but the background all the grass and the soil is blurry. Why? Because I am, I am, my, I placed my image plane in a position that only the flowers are in focus. The, the, the background and the background and the grass and the soil are here. So any point from this will be, let's say, that one, let me try to draw it like this point. We'll go to like that. And this one will go like that. And they will merge here. Okay. So it will cause lots of blurriness here. Okay. Of course, well, well this is not a, a exact, sorry, I shouldn't do that because this is confusing. It looks like I am blurring the flower itself. Of course, this point is not visible, okay? 
This point is not visible because no light will pass through this object. Let's talk about this point. Okay. Whatever goes through the center, let me try to draw it. It will go through. And this one will go like that. And it will be here. And this one, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I am doing a mistake again. Okay, so. This one will go like that. And it will go that way. One will go like that and it will go this way. So this point, this point, the green point in the real world will cause this this much blurriness on the image. So next to my next to my nicely focused point, there will be blurry image part. I don't have the same effect in here. Why? Because this aperture is so small. The points in here are focused. Also, the points that are, are almost focused too. Okay. So this is called depth of field. Depth of field. Depth of field is very large in this case and very small in this case. If you like to have this kind of an effect, you, you open up your aperture. If you like to have this kind of an effect, you close down your aperture. Okay. This is more like a pinhole camera. This is more like a, a very, very, uh, very, very uh, uh, open aperture system. I usually would show you some lenses that I have, but it doesn't make much. Let, let me try to show it again. This is my lens, monster lens, I call it. Doesn't work. Uh, it is. It's, it was a very expensive lens actually. I found it in the garbage can somewhere in the university. Okay. So as you see, um, as you see, it has a very large. It has a very large front element. It gathers lots of light. But uh, okay, I am going to try to show you. This. Where is my aperture? Okay, it is here. Here is the aperture ring. Okay, try to change the aperture. Is it stuck? No, no, it is not stuck. Okay, so I can open the aperture. You see it? I am, I am closing it now. Let me, okay, this is better. Very, very close and large. I can get lots of light. Now, it's very, very small amount of light. So there is an aperture ring here. I can move it around and change it. This, I think this one is for focus. This aperture is for, fo this, this adjustment is for focus. Okay, this one, this can, can focus from very small distances to large distances. Okay, very nicely built, tough lens from 1970s, 1960s maybe. Okay. Yeah, it says made in, made in West Germany. Did you see it? So it is from 1970s. Okay. So I don't know what Salman has asked. But I hope I, I can ask, I could answer that. Okay, so uh, if I have this kind of a geometry, actually, using this similarity of these triangles, actually, similarity of these triangles, I could find this equation. It is not that difficult. I mean, this, there is a similarity relationship between this triangle and this triangle. Okay, these are on the same line and they are shading a single. 
okay like that and another triangle is here okay so I could I could find this relationship using the similarity of the triangles I know that depth of field is this good okay so actually a uh, human eye was how did they how did they how did they invent this camera obscura this one it is by looking at the eyes of the mammals actually eyes of the mammals work this way that's why let's look at the human eye and let's try to compare human eye with the with the structure that I told you. Human eye is like this. There is a lens. Okay, this is the lens. Make it red. Transparent lens. This lens uh, can be deformed, compressed or stretched using the uh, using the muscles attached to it like that okay these muscles when they pull when they pull they stretch the lens it becomes a thinner lens and when they release it it becomes more more even more spherical spherical so uh, uh, we can deform our lenses in various ways by deforming this lens okay the image formed let's say i have an image like that okay i have a image like that the light rays coming from this point like that and like that will form on my retina okay so it will be there and this one will be like that and it will be formed here okay and my image will be on my retina upside down exactly the same rules only a single lens only a single lens on my eye okay so um, people with the uh, weaving problems like the near near sighted far sighted people they have problems with their lenses most of the time they cannot focus nearby objects or far away objects on their retinas i am a far sighted person without these glasses the near near objects are very very blurry i cannot i cannot uh, uh, make them into focus it is all blurry okay the the closest that i can see is maybe maybe half a meter half a meter i can start reading uh, uh, letters uh, uh, the, 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 it wasn't it wasn't like this all in my life all my life i think i developed it for the last five years maybe when you when you get uh, uh, aged okay when you get older these muscles they lose their strength also this lens it loses its elasticity okay it's like the regular muscles okay uh, uh, the, the older people they cannot do it uh, as as good as as efficient as the younger people or for some people uh, from the birth okay uh, uh, their eyes are from that way they cannot see nearby objects or the far away objects and in fact uh, I think 60% of the industrialized uh, uh, societies they have the they have the nearsightedness okay they are nearsighted they cannot see the far away objects they need glasses for that okay so let's try to compare this with the other with our camera model uh, here we have our iris iris is this part actually iris behaves like the here iris behaves let me use color uh, iris iris behaves like uh, the aperture ring that i showed you 
So if there is less light, our irises open up to gather more light. If there are if there is too much light, it closes down, it becomes very, very small. Uh, because the, our nerves at the back of this uh, uh, camera, eye, eyeball, is sensitive to light. If there is too much light, it will get destroyed. We need to protect it. So as, as a ref, ref, reflex, uh, uh, our body closes down these irises, okay? And in front of the lens, uh, there is cornea, uh, a, a layer of uh, transparent structure, okay? And behind the lens, uh, there, is, there is some liquid, okay, eye liquid. It is transparent, of course. And in, in, inside this eye, it is filled with liquid. If the pressure of this liquid is too much, we call it, uh, we call it, we call it uh, high, high uh, eye pressure or Göstansiyon in Turkish, what is in English? Eye pressure, eye liquid pressure. So we don't want the pressure to be high in this with this liquid. And it is some kind of a disease dangerous disease, it can cause uh, loss of vision. Okay. It has to be dealt with. What else? The retina is like this. This blue part is my our retina. This green part is our retina. Like that. Okay. So it is not a plane. It is spherical. So it is very interesting that we see lines as lines because the image that we see is not a line, it is like a curved. Okay. What else I can say? Okay. Retina is part of the human brain. Okay. These are parts of the human brain. And these are the, the whatever light we are seeing. Okay. They are sensed by the human brain cells. Okay, so since they are part of the human brain, the 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 nerves they have to extend into the retina, and they have to go to the brain like that. Okay, so there is opening here, an opening here. That takes the nerves, that takes the nerves in, to the eye, and this they call it the disc, here the disc, this disc doesn't include any light sensitive cells that's why uh, we call it blind spot whatever falls onto this part as an image will not be visible uh, by our hours we cannot see that part but most people don't realize that there is a blind spot on our eyes uh, because our our brain Makes of lots of makes lots of processing processing uh, to make that part invisible. We fill it in with the nearby information. Okay. Can you hear my uh, sound now? Yes, Selman. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, okay. What I was going to ask that what uh, when we like uh, calculate the triangles and stuff, uh, we always draw uh, straight lines. Uh, it's under the assumption of like light is, uh, behaves like a, a line, uh -huh. uh, but the less we, uh, the less photon we get, uh, the more like uh, that assumption holds uh, kind of wrong, right? Because no, no, it is not that. It is the aperture size. If the aperture size is too small, that assumption doesn't hold anymore. But even if yeah. in a, even with a single Photon that assumption holds if if it doesn't go through a small opening. Yeah, but uh, because the aperture is small, we will have less photons, so we will have less sample of the real world, and maybe that will become blurry because of that. No, maybe. it is not. No, no, it is not. Okay. Uh, blurriness is not caused by the less amount of light; it is caused by the shape of the aperture. In that case, okay, mm. aperture uh, cannot uh, be too small. Yeah, but the two kind of blurriness uh, when like the aperture is uh, large and 
when it's small, it's kind of different, right? Because one is because because of like distortion or maybe multiple focus points, and one of one of it is like has like what, another reason. What you are saying is that if I if I don't have enough uh, light sample from the real world, my sensor is not good enough, right? And I am not going to get a, a good enough light, and it will cause noise. It may happen. But in this case, we are not talking about the uh, sensing problems. We are talking about uh, the image itself, okay? The image itself is blurred when it is formed on the back side of the camera. It is not because the light is, uh, uh, the amount of light is uh, not enough, okay? It is but, because, it is yeah, because the shape of the aperture. Like the uh, double split experiment, like, uh, when you have more rays, you have like uh, more photons on the part where uh, you want uh, the light to be behave as like line, maybe. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's kind of like... In the the amount of light doesn't cause blurriness. It may cause maybe the shifts in the color, intensity problems, but it is not going to cause any blurriness. Image will okay. be sharp, but the quality might be low. Hmm. But if the light went like straight lines, uh -huh. it should be sharper always, right? We don't know. I don't know. <laughs> okay. uh, well, I mean, nobody says that we understood light a hundred percent. Okay, there are many. There are many theories. One of the theories is light travels like uh, on a straight path. Okay. The other theory says that light travels on a wave. And uh, the, the length of the wave is important to understand what is going on. Each theory is able to explain some part of the behavior, but they cannot explain the whole thing. It's like physics, right? Newton's, mechan Newton's uh, uh, formulas, uh, like the F and M and A, it can explain the, the, motion, of the motion of the objects uh, to some extent on, on our uh, everyday life. But when you try to explain the behavior of the stars, behavior of the light traveling, Newton's rules doesn't work anymore, right? Or when you try to explain the behavior of the uh, subatomic particles, like electrons and the uh, uh, small particles, right? Newton's mechanism, Newton's theory of motion doesn't work. It's something like that. So that doesn't mean that we don't use a Newton's law. We use Newton's law to design our buildings. We use Newton's law to design cars, moving parts, and everything. Right? It works on the on the real world to some extent, and we don't need any more precision. Okay, so uh, uh, we are going to use that uh, uh, light traveling uh, on a straight line assumption all over the course, and we are going to ignore this problem because nobody builds that kind of. Nobody builds that kind of uh, aperture. Like the smallest aperture is the one that I showed you. Okay, this is the smallest aperture that you're gonna see. On um, you see the aperture, right? Yeah. That's the smallest. You can, I cannot get any smaller than that because in that case, my in that case uh, uh, my sensor will have a very difficult time. So I think somebody else has a question too. I don't know who, but let me try to find it out. I have a question. Okay, sure. Do uh, I... uh, think about that we are looking at the screen, um, and uh, the image is formed at the back of our eyes. Yeah. Uh, reversed uh, form. Yeah, upside down, yes. Yeah, uh, but when we turn our head uh, right or left, uh, we continue seeing straight. Uh, so does the brain determine the position of the image uh, by guessing it, making some, uh, making some cal calculations? You, okay, you are saying that I am not seeing upside down. You are seeing upside. You are seeing the straight up. Is that what you are saying? Uh, yes, but uh, when we turn our head uh, right, um, we see the same scene. Uh, we don't see it. Uh, we don't see it um, turn right. Ah, uh, you mean uh, upside down and not right left uh, transformation? Well, it's a 
mirror effect, right? Well, I mean, if this is the, um, well, how, how can I tell you that? Well, it is the same thing. I mean, uh, this is the object. Okay. Uh, let me let me try to show it to you on this okay so this blue here let me try to make okay this blue point is this blue point right is that correct yes how about this one this red is which one this one or that one right hand side this one right and this green is this green where is green this green is so upside it is upside down left and right are switched again You know the effect, right? I mean, whatever goes through, it, it has to be a line, and it has the at the end of the other part of the other part of the image plane. Okay. Uh, I, I want to ask that uh, when we uh, when we turn our head um, thirteen degree. Yeah. Uh, we still, uh, we still saw uh, the image. Uh, how do you know what you see? You don't. How do you know what you see? I mean, when you do this, how do you know what you see? Because you don't know what kind of image forms on your retina, right? You have a sense of what you see from your inference, from your brain. There is lots of processing going on. And to be able to say what you are seeing, you need to cut somebody's eye, like they did that too, like this. This is cow's eye. And, and view it from there and see, oh, okay, this is happening that way or that way. You don't know what is going on in your eye right now. So we don't see uh, what we see. We yeah, see kind of. Yeah, you don't see what you see. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. These are all sensors. Okay. These are information. The information that you gather from outside world is either light sensors, okay, or through your ears, sound sense, sound uh, sensitive uh, cells, or from your tactile okay touch sensitive cells uh, what else or from your tongue uh, chemical sensors there right so you get all these signals they are all fed to through your brain's layers at the end you make some inferences you will say that oh, okay this is a computer this is this is this is something salty this is something loud very uh, uh, bass sound etc These are all sensing stuff. So you think that it is happening in your eye, but you don't know what is happening in your eye. And uh, how do human eye sees? I'm going to talk a little bit more. Maybe that question uh, will be clearer for you in a few minutes. Okay, so we talked about this retina. We talked about the blind spots. There is a good experiment to find your blind spot and uh, uh, do that experiment everybody find your blind spots everybody has two one each uh, eye that's a good experiment let's look at the structure of the retina actually as i said before as i said before retina is extension of the human brain okay uh, that's why the retina transplants are not possible 
you cannot transplant the human parts of the human brain yet. And if something happens with your re with somebody's retina, it's a brain surgery, okay? And you cannot do much with the brain actually. So this is the part of the retina. We are looking at this part, very small part, okay? So the light comes in, it passes through one, two, three layers of specific cells and it reaches the uh, light sensitive cells. So light has to pass through a few layers of other types of cells. Okay, so these are some blood cells, communication cells and etc. See, these cells are connected to the, these ones and they are connected to those and they are all put together and they go to brain. Before they go to brain, okay, before they go to brain, there is some processing going on on your retina. If you have 10 million, if you have 10 million light sensitive cells on your retina, only 1 million cables go to the brain. That means that lots of stuff are processed on your eye. Okay? On your eye. And that's really interesting that your that's really interesting that your light sensitive cells are not in front of the other blood cells. So that means that our vision is kind of blocked. Okay? Whatever we see, we don't realize it. So maybe this is related to your question again. Whatever you see, it is all blocked by your blood vessels. There are many blood blood picture, blood vessel pictures on your vision, but like this disc, uh, the, the 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 blind disc, blind spot, our brain is very good at filtering out that effect. I think there was a very good experiment somewhere I saw. This is the experiment. This is how you see your blood vessels on your retina. Just look at the bright screen like this. Okay, this is a white screen. Okay, make your fingers like this, very small aperture. Okay, it's a very small aperture, right? Very small aperture. You are trying to make your, uh, you are trying to make your, um, uh, uh, eye like a pinhole camera okay look through that small opening to the bright screen okay you are looking at the bright screen now and slowly slowly move your fingers around like in a circular fashion you are gonna see you are gonna see some kind of a some kind of a mesh of structure those are your those are your uh, blood vessel network on your eye on the center you don't see much because on the center those blood vessels are not much but around it there is a lot and i can see it it is very interesting it's like circular some of them are very large actually don't make it very uh, move it only a, 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 a small amount, but do it in a fast way, okay? So that's how you see your blood vessels on your retina, okay? The, do I, maybe this is a further a, a further answer to your question. You, you don't know what's going on on your retina, and lots of lots of lots of things are happening, and we don't realize it. You don't know what kind of frequency analysis are being done on your ears too. There are theories of it. Okay, so, oh, okay, here is, there is a YouTube uh, video that tells you how to do the experiment that I showed you right now. This is the YouTube video. Okay. Okay, so, um, um, some animals, uh, okay, th this, is, this is not always the case. For the humans and most of the mammals, I guess, the light has to go through these layers and has to reach the light-sensitive cells. But for some animals, 
They like sensitive cells are at the top. Okay? Uh, for some reason it is like that and we don't know. I mean, we don't know why ours is here. We don't know why theirs are there. I don't know it is there. But for some animals, it is interesting. They have this structure. Like, like those animals are like cows, not humans. Okay? Uh, bears and whatever whatever who has to uh, who has to see better during the night they have this kind of vision they have a they have a okay tapetum lucidum layer at the bottom of the retina when the light comes in they sense the light light goes through and light is reflected back from the back of the retina and they see that reflected light too so they sense the same light two times that means that even the light amount of light is uh, very little they can see it during the night of course the reflected light is kind of scattered that makes the image a little bit blurry but that doesn't matter. i mean they don't have to see very very sharp during the night as long as they see their prey as long as they see their predator, they should be fine. And this is a this is a cow's eye, okay, cut in in half, and they they are shining light, and it is reflected back from the from the tapetum uh, lucidum layer of the eye. Humans don't have this uh, reflected layer, okay. Two types of light uh, sensitive receptors, cones and rods. Okay, cones are like that, and they are sensitive to light. Three types of cones: there are red cones, green cones, and blue cones (RGB). That's where we get this RGB thing. Okay, we call it about the RGB space. Okay, we call it RGB pixels. RGB sensor and etc. That that's where we get it. Okay, human human eye works with RGB. We see red, we see green, and we see blue. Rods are not like that. Rods are sensitive to light only. Okay, so grayscale only. Okay, but they are very very highly sensitive to uh, light. Even at night, uh, they can they can they can be. They can be activated. Even a single photon, even a single photon, uh, can be sensed by this rod. Okay, good. So that that means that why don't we see as good as, like the uh, animals, like the owl, or the wolf, or the cow? Why don't we see? as good as them because I, I'm going to show you why we don't see it even though we have rods our rods are not that frequently or uh, uh, or that densely set, uh, placed on our eye and we are going to see and this is the distribution if this is our eye and this part let me show okay this part corresponds to there this part corresponds to here and this part corresponds to this part. Okay, so from 80, minus 80 degrees to 80 degrees. This is minus 80. This is zero. This is 80. Okay. So if I, if I give you the distribution of the density of the rods and cones. Okay. Rods and cones. Okay. As you see, rods are, rods are, rods are, uh, Dancers in these areas, the areas that I am drawing with green, these are the rods. Okay, but in the center, in the center with the blue area, especially here, are the cones. That area is important. That's fovea or macula. Okay. That area has the highest amount of cones. And that area is maybe four or 
five millimeter squares, very small area. And we see all the details using, using that small area only. Fovea. Okay. Only, only this part. Macula fovea. Okay. See the visual axis? The axis, the main axis of the uh, our visual system is that part. And uh, we are doing our reading using that area only. Other than that area, we cannot see any detail. Much detail. Okay, if you if you like to see the detail, I have to rotate my eyeball so that whatever I am interested in falls in there. When I'm reading something, I have to move my eye from one point to other point because only this part reads the text. Okay, so in that area of the eye, we do, I don't have much rod. I have many cones. So only that part of the eye actually sees colors. The other other parts of the eye doesn't see colors. The other parts of the eye actually sensitive to light. It's sensitive to light, but it doesn't know what it sees actually because uh, uh, there is not much detail there. Okay, the details are not there. Only we sense stuff. If somebody is coming from side. I can sense that somebody something is coming, but I need to change my uh, eye position and look at it that way, either changing my head or doing this eye movements. Okay. Any questions so far with the lenses and the human eye? Any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, I will take 10 minutes of break. Let's be here around 
Okay, let's continue. Um, so this is the distribution of the rods and cones. Rods are sensitive to light, cones are sensitive to uh, color. And other than this uh, small area of uh, fovea, we cannot see the color very well, but it is there is lots of light sensitive cones. With the all the details are seen with the fovea. Okay, I will I will skip this one. So uh, the 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 colors that we see are actually uh, are limited. Uh, we see we see the visible spectrum between these 400 nanometers and uh, 700 nanometers. Uh, uh, below our uh, visible light are the uh, infrared, okay, and uh, 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 beyond our uh, visible spectrum are the infrared rays and the ultraviolet uh, violet, uh, rays, and uh, uh, these are, as you see, as you know, these are all coming from the uh, the the sun, sun produces all kinds of different uh, waves, electromagnetic waves, and our eye has special sensors to detect these electromagnetic waves at this position as light. Okay, so actually our eyes are electromagnetic, electro electromagnetic, electromagnetic sensors, and it is only sensitive to. Uh, a certain spectrum of these wavelengths. We cannot see X-rays. We cannot see uh, microwaves. There are some animals they can see infrared light better. Okay, so they see during the night uh, uh, better. But humans eye, human eyes are not that good with the infrared uh, uh, rays. So uh, this course is not about human eye, but of course we like to know about the human eye so that we can compare our cameras with the human eye. Let's look at the practical cameras, digital cameras especially. This is a digital camera without any lens. It doesn't have a lens. The part that you see here, the part that you see here is the sensor of the digital camera. Okay, there are 6,000 columns and 4,000 rows of these sensors. So a total of 24 megapixels of sensors, 24 million sensors available in this camera. You put a lens in front of it. You put a lens in front of this uh, camera. You mount it. So that lens focuses the light on the sensor and the sensor measures the amount of light coming to each pixel okay types of sensors ccd sensors charge coupled devices or nowadays cmos is most more frequently used cmos okay <coughs> there are some other uh, variants but uh, especially especially the the variants of cmos sensors uh, and nowadays these sensors are not they don't want to make the sensors too too small uh, they like to make it larger so that it gathers more light as Salman was asking to get more light is better why because we are getting more samples of light from the real world it is better for the uh, noise aspects of the image for each pixel I get more light and that more light means that I will sense the colors better. I will sense the intensity better. Okay. So they don't want to make this too, too, too small. Okay. Uh, what kind of terminology we have with the digital cameras, especially the noise. Noise is important. Noise is this. If I am measuring the amount of light on a pixel on on one of the elements of this 24 million pixels okay if i am measuring the amount of light i am not going to measure it perfectly uh, uh, right 
Okay. I am going to measure a little bit high, a little bit low. That's called noise. Okay. And we don't like noise. Uh, we like to use sensors that 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 introduce only small amount of noise. And large sensors, they introduce less amount of noise. Okay, so the difference between the difference between this camera, the sensor is very large, and this camera, this camera on my cell phone, this sensor is small, much smaller than that. Uh, I expect this camera, if if they are using, if they are used, uh, if they are built using the same technology of pixels. I expect this camera to produce less noisy images. Compression is important because 24 million pixels, if each one is producing three bytes, one for red, one for green, and one for blue. Actually, it is not three bytes. Sometimes it is six bytes, okay? I have 16 bit uh, images. So it's a lot of data. I need to compress this data. And usually they compress it using lossy. Okay? Lossy algorithms. That means that when I uncompress the data, I don't get the exact same image. It is a little bit different. For the human eye, uh, maybe the maybe the difference is not that big, but uh, it is different. So lossy Compression is important, and most of the cameras that we use today, they do this compression. Our image format JPEG, okay, is a lossy compression format, okay? So the color is important. How do we get the color from the cameras? Our cameras, they don't have... R sensitive, G sensitive, B sensitive uh, sensors. Our sensors are light sensitive sensors. It is like it is like these it is like these rods. Okay, our sens sensors are rods. So how do we get the color? We use filters in front of them. Let's say light is coming this way. Okay, and these are our sensors. These are our sensors. So these sensors measure only amount of light. But if I put a green filter in front of it, if I put a red filter in front of it, and if I put a blue fil filter in front of it, like that. So each pixel, each pixel becomes sensitive to certain wavelength of the light okay certain wavelength of the light this is this is how the regular cameras work this is how the regular cameras uh, work so the way you put those patterns of put those patterns of pixels in a camera is important and this is called Bayer pattern. Bayer pattern is like that. Okay. So for a line, it is blue, green, blue, green, blue, green. And the next line is green, red, green, red, green, red, then blue, green, blue, green. As you see, as you see, half of the pixels are green pixels. Does anybody know why they have chosen green for the half of the pixels? Half of the pixels are green. One quarter of the pixels are blue. One quarter of the pixels are red. Do you, do you know why have chosen the green as one half of the pixels? mimicking uh, human eye. I don't know. It might be right. I don't know. It might be right. Uh, but as far as I know, green is very good at uh, uh, resolution. 
resolving with the green is better for the intensity for the for the detail sorry <coughs> okay another concept with the digital cameras is blooming blooming is this let's say i have my sensor here let's say this pixel received too much light if this one receives too much light and if these the neighboring ones did not receive any light okay i expect that this one will produce very high value these are producing very small values but it doesn't happen due to the structure of these electronic circuits if this one is very high this one will get higher too this is called the blooming effect okay overflowing into the neighboring pixels blooming effect and that's not that's not a very good effect it's a bad effect okay in camera processing it is done a lot okay before producing the the, the jpeg uh, file or other files there is lots of sharpening going on historicization etc okay stabilization is something else what they do is what they do is some cameras they they have gyro sensors they know how much the camera move right when you are taking a picture if your hand is shaking they have gyro sensors okay accelerometers they know how much the camera moves if i move the sensor in the opposite direction of the movement of the camera that means that I am stabilizing the sensor. That's a very good idea. So I can take more stable, uh, sharper images. And this is one way of producing less blurry images. Okay. Some cameras, they don't, they don't move the sensor, but they move their lenses. They move their lenses. And that's a, that's a very good solution actually. okay yusuf has found something he says that green light is more sensitive the human eye is it's more sensitive to the green light so they are preferring the human yeah okay good okay so uh let's go back and let's try to remember why we are doing all this we are trying to understand how the image is formed on a camera and i like to do this i like to do this okay this is a model geometric model of a camera well it's a model it's a theoretical model of course it mimics the real world cameras but by ignoring a few things mathematically we will be doing much better this is what i am trying to do if i have a point on the re in the real world and that point lives on this uh, position xyz i like to find its position on my projection plane that is on my image okay so i like to find x prime y prime given x y z what is x prime and y prime in this case as you see my projection plane or film plane is this distance away from the center of projection d is the d is kind of reflects the focal length okay i'm going to call it d my in this case i'm going to keep it changing but in this case my xyz system is like that so it is a right-handed system right first what is my right-handed system if this is my x z direction if i do this if i do this first i uh, hold the x axis then y so let me do this see it is first x then y right-handed uh, coordinate system it is not left-handed with the left-handed coordinate system this is x this is y okay in this case i am doing this okay so uh, what else this is positive z direction positive x and positive y direction so my image plane is at the negative part of the z direction so it is minus d away from the zero 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 this is center of projection 
in my model world this is how the images are formed if i have a point like that in the real world what i am doing is i am drawing a line between this point and the and the uh, point uh, the between the central projection and the point so what i am doing is here like that okay so this point here is the projection of that real point on the real world okay so i am i am i am after this if this position x y z what is this x prime y prime actually it is not that difficult to find right the it is the it is the it is the similarity of the triangles again similarity of the triangles again what is this length what is that length the blue length why why right the ratio of y over what is the green length ratio of y over what is y prime, y prime is equal to um, let me use the red what is this and this is this is z right z and and what is do I, do I have any colors now let me use the black then what is this then what is this this is d right this is minus d minus d but they will cancel each out uh, they will cancel each out right so what is y prime then how do i get the y prime so y prime is y prime is d times y over z right so i found it y prime is d times y over z and x prime is similarly d times x over z so by looking at the similarities of these rectangles i can come up with these equations using on this simple model well okay with, with this simple model i ignored many things but it's a good start i can i can i can do that what did i ignore uh, okay d is kind of our focal length and i need to get my focal length from the camera i kind of kind of find it but the thing is this xyz are in the real world right xyz are in the real world and they are measured kind of in terms of millimeters or meters whatever so this point is in the real world if this is my zero 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 in the real world okay xyz are expressed maybe 100 millimeters in x 107 millimeters in y and minus 200.2 millimeters in z okay this is xyz but x prime y prime will be measured again in millimeters but i don't want to do that why because this is my image my image is like a matrix i have rows and columns i like to say this x prime and y prime is this point that is 10th row and 15th column I like to I like to do that so uh, I, I, I I like to be able to so, say things like that okay if you are at this point in the real world your image will be at this position on my image I don't want to give the positions of on of that uh, point on my image plane in terms of millimeters these are all millimeters I don't want to do it in millimeters 
because that doesn't mean much. That doesn't mean much. So what am I going to do? I need to know the size of each pixel, right? If I know the size of each pixel in terms of millimeters, then I can do this. Um, then I can do this division. Ah, come on. I can do this division and I can find I can find uh, which pixel it belongs to. Okay, that's 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 one thing. The other thing is that um, there are certain parameters in the cameras that we need to be careful about. In fact, let's go over our camera model and let's try to see what kind of other stuff we should have to find exactly given this XYZ in the real world. I like to find uh, I like to find how it relates to my image position using mathematical expressions as simple as this okay we are not going to do anything more complicated than multiplication and division okay so this is what i did okay so if i have xyz in the real world it will correspond to d times x over z and d times y over z since i am at the negative side i put a minus in front z is minus d okay because the, the projection plane is at that position okay so i am projecting a three-dimensional point to a two-dimensional point note that let me do this note that if i continue this line let's say this is x1 let's say this is p1 let's say this is p2 the image of both p1 and p2 corresponds to the exact same point here right p1 and p2 are two different points in the real world but their images are exactly are exactly at the same point why is this why is this so because this is projection we are losing one of the dimensions right something has to share the same position with the other things in fact all the all the points on this line this point this point this point this point infinitely many points on this line will be on this x prime y prime point exactly okay so by taking pictures of the real world actually we are losing lots of information that's why it is very difficult to find the depth of points from a single image i can find the x and y etc but i cannot find the depth of the point from a single image it is not that easy okay good so um, i am going to introduce a new notation now uh, it is called homogeneous coordinates using the homogeneous coordinates our calculation of the projection will be much easier homogeneous coordinates are very useful tools okay uh, very useful tools and they are very simple actually uh, in the homogeneous coordinates this is what we do x and y are two dimensional inhomogeneous coordinates our regular coordinate system x and y if i like to express x and y in homogeneous coordinates this is what i do i just make the vector a column vector x y and one i just add a one if this is my three-dimensional regular coordinate system point x y z i like to make this homogeneous coordinates x y z and one that's it so this is inhomogeneous this is what we have been using so far this is inhomogeneous and these are homogeneous so i increase the dimensionality of the vector by one still this is a two-dimensional point in homogeneous coordinates three-dimensional point in homogeneous coordinates but i express them using four numbers instead of three 
coming back from homogeneous coordinates to the inhomogeneous coordinates is like x, y, w. I just divide them. x over w, y over w. If w is 1, then it is just x and y. w doesn't have to be 1 all the time. I mean, when you do this conversion, when you do this conversion, I put a 1 here, but when you come back, this w doesn't have to be 1. Okay, well, it might sound silly for you right now. <laughs> Why are we using such a silly thing? You might see, you might think, but you are gonna see that this is much more. This has a much more powerful representation power than this one. This has a much more representation power than this one, because with this notation, now I can present the points at infinity, and linear arithmetic is going to be much linear arithmetic is going to be much easier with this approach okay and we are going to see it in a few minutes and it's going to be very helpful in our uh, cases okay does anybody know about the homogeneous coordinates from some other courses Coefficient on the in the bin for yeah on a, or a differential equation uh, where it equals to some. Uh, no, no, I I don't think that these are related. No, no, no. Homogeneous coordinate systems. Where did you see it? And uh, not coordinate system. It was like differential equations. No, well, I mean homogeneous is a very generic term. You could use it in that place. Anybody took graphics course? Computer graphics, they use homogeneous systems in there too. Anyway, that's okay. That's fine. I'm going to, okay. So, in the homogeneous coordinate systems, points are, okay, in two-dimensional homogeneous coordinate systems, points are represented with three numbers. Lines are represented the same way too. This is an equation of a line, right? Ax plus by plus c. So, a, B, C represents a line. Why do I have a T in here? Because I like to represent things like column vectors. A, B, C. So this is the transpose of this row vector. This is a column vector. So you're going to see this T a lot. So don't, don't get confused with it. Okay. So A, B, C represents a line. A, B, C. So this one represents a line. We know this. We, we know this from our primary school years. Okay? From our primary school uh, years. Let's look at this one. If A, B, C, L is a line, and if X is a point on a two-dimensional world, then if X is on this line, then I should be able to satisfy this equation, right? Ax plus by plus c should be able it should be equal to zero if ABC presents a line x and y are the coordinates of the point. So how do I represent this x and y in the in the uh, homogeneous coordinate system? This is what I do, right? X y one is the representation of the point in the homogeneous coordinate system. ABC is the representation of the line in the homogeneous coordinate system. If I do a dot product, okay, remember this means X, Y, 1, and A, B, C. If the result of it is zero, how do you multiply it? This is AX plus YB plus C equals to zero, right? That product. Okay. So using the homogeneous coordinate system notation, this is what I get. Okay. XY1 times ABC transpose is zero or like that. Okay. So this is what we say. 
in the homogeneous coordinate system, the point x lies on the line x if and only if x t l equal to l t x equal to zero. Doesn't matter. I multiply, I put the x first or y, l first. It is the same thing. I should be able to get zero from both of them. Okay. This definition, uh, it's related. Like uh, I saw it on wiki right now, and yeah, like it's the same as uh, linear uh, homogeneous equations because it corresponds to. A point. Okay, so you are talking about the homogeneous differential equations. No linear equations. Last okay. time I said I know differential, but okay. I know we can. Okay, okay. good. So that, that's it. So what did we do? So I represented, I represented this a point belonging to a line using this uh, nice linear equation. Just multiplication. Multiply dot with a line. If you get a zero, this dot, this point is a, is on that line. I know this one in two dimensional words. Okay. So more is coming. Let's look at more. Okay. So this is the this is the other feature. Nice. If I have two lines L and L prime, cross product of these two lines is the intersection of these two lines. Okay. I have two lines. Each line is a two three dimensional. I have two lines. Each line is a two dimensional vector if i take the cross product of these two dimensional vectors okay i get the i get the intersection point of two lines okay this is nice and with the, the dual of this uh, the, uh, definition or the theorem the line joining two points if i have two points x and x prime if I remember x and x prime are in homogeneous uh, coordinate system, they are in homogeneous coordinate system. And if I take the cross product of these two points, I will get the line joining these two. Very convenient. Okay, very, very uh, convenient. Maybe you should be asking a question here. What did I say? I said that if I have two lines and if I take a cross product of them, I will get the intersection point of that line, right? These two lines. And how do you get the intersection? How do you get the cross product of two lines? Here's one. Okay, you put IJK here and these three numbers. Let's look at let's let's do let's do this. How do you how do you represent this line? In homogeneous coordinates. Okay, what is this? This point in homogeneous coordinates. Tell me that uh, point in homogeneous coordinates. Uh, it's a set of uh, lines, right? No, no, no. I, I like to. I like, tell me this point in homogeneous coordinates. What is this point in homogeneous coordinates? Mm. One, one, one. one. One, 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 exactly. This is the one, one, one. So this is our L1. This is our L2. When I do this L1 cross product L2, I am going to get one, one, one transpose. So what is L1? Tell me uh, the L1. Remember uh, A, B, C. A x plus B y plus C is equal to zero. What should I put in A and B and C so that I can represent this line? What should be the A? Equal to one, isn't this equation? Which one is one? Uh, the middle one. Why? Why is one? Why? Okay. Uh, why, zero. Why? One zero. If y is 1, mm -hmm. okay, 
What is a, uh, what is what is x what is you, you cannot say y is one. I mean you are you are supposed to x and y changes, right? You are supposed to tell me a b c, not x and y. X and y are all the points in this line, right? Including one one one. Then what is a? What is b? What is c? On this line, all the x's are one, right? Is that true? Yes. All the x's are one on this line. So I, I assume that all the x's are one. So if I make my a one, a times x, I know that all the x's are one. All the y's are, y's are changing, right? I don't care what the y's are, okay? I don't care what the y's are, y could be anything. So I will multiply y by zero. Then to be able to make this a zero, I need to put a negative one in here. So minus one, right? Is that correct? Yeah. So this line L1 is, one zero minus one transpose. What is L two? L two is just the symmetric of it. Uh, we have to zero one minus a, one. A is zero. Uh, one minus one. Two yeah, just the just the symmetric zero one and minus one, right? So. I have represented these two lines using the homogeneous coordinates. Let's see if it works. If I multiply this with this, it should be zero, right? Also, if I multiply with this with this, it should be zero too, right? So let's do this. If I multiply one, one, one with this one, it is one times one plus one times zero plus one times minus one, it is zero, right? And do the same thing again. 0 times 1 plus 1 times 1 plus 1 times minus 1, I take in 0. So this point lies on both of these lines, L1 and L2. Okay, let's see if this formula gives me, if this formula gives me the intersection point of this one. Okay, let's run this. I am going to move this here. Keep it there and I'm going to do this. I, J, K, one, zero, minus one, zero, one, minus one. You guys remember this? Taking the cross product of two vectors. Okay, it is I times, I times, you remember that, right? I times, this times this, minus this times that, right? So, I times zero, minus one, one, minus one. Okay, minus J times one zero minus one minus one and then k times one zero zero one what does it make i zero minus minus one times one minus j minus one minus zero minus one right and plus k times one so it is i minus minus is one i times one j times one and k times one so that means it is one 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 transpose so i found it okay i found it 
So it works. Intersection of two lines are like that. Good. Now, go back to this one. Ask me the question that I like you to ask. What kind of question is this? There's another question, okay? I'm, I'm asking you to ask me the question that I want you to ask me. There is something important that you should, that you should see right now. When you look at this formula, you should be saying something like, mm, what happens? Uh, wow, 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 okay. We can, uh, can we see the motion in a picture? Uh, what do you mean picture? I, this is a picture, I showed you the notion. I gave you an example. And in fact, I can explain this to you. If I, if I take a cross product of two vectors, the resulting, the resulting vector is a three-dimensional vector and I expect that that three-dimensional vector is uh, 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 perpendicular to the original two vectors, right? We know that too. But I am not asking that. As, as an engineer, as a, as a computer scientist, when you look at this sentence, intersection of two lines is this, you should be asking a question right now. But, but what happens? Something like that. Is that parallel? Yes, exactly, Cesar. What happens if they are parallel, okay? What happens if they are parallel? What am I gonna get? The formula is still valid, right? The formula is still valid. Should we do it? Let's do this. If they are parallel, let me do this now. If they are parallel, let me get rid of this part. Let me get rid of this part. Okay. If they are parallel, I am going to do this. X is 2. Huh? Good. Let me copy this, put it away. Maybe you're gonna use it later. So let's write this again. I, J, K, one, zero, minus one. What is the line for this X equal to two? Two zero minus two. Mm, is it? No, one zero minus two, right? One zero minus two. Because I know that everything is on x is two, right? I multiply two with one. I multiply y with zero. Since all the x's are two on this one, I need the, the minus two. Is that correct? Yes. By the way, this line, 1, 0, minus 1, and 2, 0, minus 2 are exactly the same line. Whatever satisfies this line, it should satisfy this line too. Try it, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. It will satisfy this one. 1, 1, 1 will satisfy this one too. So even though they look like two different lines, but they are the same line. Why? Because this is in a homogeneous coordinate system. And uh, the, the notion of line satisfies that one. We'll come to the, that one and we are going to talk it later. Okay, let's write this. I times 0, 0, minus 1, minus 2, minus j times 1 minus 1 1 minus 2 and k times 1 0 1 0 what do I get now
what do I get now? So this is zero. That's one Plus component. Two. Zero. This is minus two. Minus two. Minus minus one. Minus one, right? Is that correct? Minus two, minus minus one. Okay, minus one, and then zero again. Oh, okay, I have a minus one here too, so it is plus one. So, zero, one, zero. Where is zero, one, zero? What, what was this one? This is one, 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 right? That, that was the position. Now I am trying to find zero one zero. Where is zero one zero? On my plane. This is in this is this is in homogeneous coordinates. To convert this to in homogeneous coordinates, what do I do? I would divide zero by zero and one by zero, right? But this is division by zero. I cannot do that. So this is a point in homogeneous coordinate system that is not representable in non-homogeneous coordinate system in my world. Because where, where do these two lines intersect? They intersect inf at infinity, right? And I cannot show you the infinity on this, on this ordinance coordinate system. Because this is a inhomogeneous coordinate system that I am showing you. So, the, the, what does that mean? This means that this homogeneous coordinate system can represent la, uh, the points at infinity. Understand? I can talk now about points at infinity. Previously, I couldn't do that. Okay, Previously, I would say that, okay, these two lines intersect at infinity. That means I cannot do anything about it. But now I can talk about the points at infinity using our mathematical expressions, okay? This formula works for any line set, any, any two lines, including the parallel lines. Parallelism is not a specific thing anymore for me, okay? I say that any two lines, they intersect. Any two lines, they intersect. And this is the formula that finds the intersection. And that includes the points at, points at infinity. Okay? Points at infinity. Good. Okay? So, th that's, that's the nice thing about this homogeneous coordinate system. Points at infinity are not exceptions. They are regular points for me now. And that will be very, very useful. Yes? You have a question? Somebody has a question. Can you, can you, Yusuf, can you talk a little bit louder? Okay, and uh, why did we divide it to zero? I missed that part. Uh, well, that's the definition of the conversion between homogeneous coordinate systems and uh, our old non-homogeneous coordinate system. If a point is in the homogeneous coordinate system, how do you come back to our system? You divide the numbers by the third element. Okay, good. Any other questions? Why, why do we divide uh, this third element? That's what Yusuf asked. This is how you go to from non-homogeneous system to homogeneous system, right? You add a one at the end. This is non-homogeneous, this is homogeneous. And this is how you come back from the homogeneous system to our non-homogeneous coordinate system. You divide both two numbers with the third one. That's our definition. That's how we define our homogeneous coordinate system. What we did was we said that if the lines or points are represented in the homogeneous coordinate system, if you cross product two lines, that will give you the intersection point of those two lines. Then we tested this formula 
with two parallel lines. And those two parallel lines gave me this 0, 1, 0 point. Now I like to go back to non-homogeneous coordinate system to see where this line is. Okay. I divide 0 by 0, 1 by 0, and it doesn't divide because 0 by 0, 1 by 0 are things that I don't know. I'm, those, are, those are stuff that I don't deal with. So that means that I cannot do this. I cannot come back from the non-homogeneous coordinate system, homogeneous coordinate system to non-homogeneous coordinate system. I cannot represent this point on my regular Cartesian coordinate system like that. It was easy with this one, 1, 1, 1. Why? Because 1 over 1, comma, 1 over 1. It was 1.1, 1 .1, right? 1, comma, comma, 1. But now I cannot do the same thing with this point. Then that's a nice thing. Why? Because with the homogeneous coordinate systems, it is easy to talk about points at infinity. Okay? Infinity is not an unknown to, to me right, right now. Okay? Infinity is something regular, okay? Infinity, the, the this point at infinity is as regular as this point here at the 1, 1. Okay, good. So, uh, can I ask some questions? Uh, sure. So, uh, here we say uh, 0, 1, 0 is on infinity, right? 0, 1, 0 is, should be at infinity, yeah. It's an infinity uh, point. But this represents a point in our 3D world. Uh, so, uh, does this mean that point is outside of our 2D plane? No, 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 no. No. Mm -hmm. This point 111 is in two dimensional world. This point is in two dimensional world too. But we use three dimensional vectors to represent those those points. We are still in two dimensional world, okay? This one, okay? This one, this point, it is in it is in P2, homogeneous coordinate system, two-dimensional system. I could use three-dimensional vectors to represent a two-dimensional point on a two-dimensional system. I never said that we are now in three-dimensional world. We are only using three-dimensional vectors. So it has more representation power, including the points at infinity. Can we say that uh, we, we represent in homogeneous coordinates with vectors in, a, uh, in another space? Can we say that? Can, could you repeat that to I again? I did not understand your question exactly. Um, can, can we say that we are representing a, a point it, uh, is in a in homogeneous coordinate system, uh, we, we will re represent it in a, in, with three vectors in another space. Yeah, you could say that exactly. Yes, exactly. I mean, we have two dimensional points. Previously, we were using two dimensional vectors to represent two dimensional points. Now we are using three dimensional vectors to represent two dimensional points. You could say that this is another space, a representation space. Not the physical space, but a representation space. Uh, so we, we, uh, we are using a, uh, we are using a three uh, parameters in three, three, uh, 2D uh, coordinate system. Exactly, yes. So because of that, we are, uh, we can in intersect two lines in uh, infinity in yeah. in genius yeah. system mm -hmm. uh, two parallel lines does not intersect is it right i i, I understand right yeah uh, since we are using three parameters to represent two dimensional objects we have more representation power now we can talk about 
if we are smart, now we can talk about points at infinity. Okay, because we have more vector space to waste, right? Or or or, or in our disposition. So that, that that that's a nice way of looking at it. Yes, that's 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 true. But the other thing is the other thing is let's go back a little bit. This line and this line are exactly the same line in the homogeneous coordinate system. So there is lots of redundancy too. Okay? Because as you remember, if a point is on this line, then doesn't matter if I multiply all the numbers with k because when you add them up, it will it will be equal to zero, right? So there is lots of redundancy to represent a point or to represent a line okay you have infinitely many different ways of expressing it including this one or including any of these okay it's kind of similar to it's kind of similar to what we did before remember what i said this x prime and y prime represents all the points on this line infinitely many it's like projections of them right x prime and y prime it is kind of similar to this this abc or k times abc represents the same line or same point these are nice features of homogeneous coordinate system actually uh, people beginning of 1900s geometry was very important uh, like 3000 years ago to or from the aristotle days okay from the old greek geometry was very important and geometry had a few assumptions like the if you if you if you take these assumptions they said you could solve any geometric problems that is possible one of the assumptions was okay if you have a if you have two lines two lines will intersect at most one position okay like that you cannot intersect two lines in more than one position that was one of the assumptions the other assumption is this two parallel lines do not intersect okay so there are some other assumptions too. Using these assumptions, you can develop your whole geometric theory. But at the beginning of 1900, somebody said that. Somebody said that. Why do we assume that? Why do we assume that two parallel lines do not intersect? I am going to assume that two parallel lines intersect. Okay. That's going to give me the homogeneous coordinate system. And using this homogeneous coordinate system, I can do many useful stuff and we are going to show you what kind of useful stuff we have now okay i'm going to show you those it is something like that somebody said that i can take the square root of minus one people were saying that there is no point of taking of it because you cannot say no i am going to define it as like i now i know how to take the square root of minus one and it's going to be very useful for me to uh, to solve some of the problems in polynomials like that one. So they were saying that if I have three roots of this polynomial, and if I assume that the first root is a imaginary number, that will help me to solve the second and the third root, which are real numbers. And people were surprised. So making these kind of assumptions or making these kind of assumptions invalid will have you will help you mathematically in many ways and we are going to see it uh, later but now i need to take some break okay are there any questions yes yeah we can represent uh, infinity of point in homogeneous system yes but uh, we don't know where uh, far away from the origin am i right uh, how, can, can i measure the distance between that point 
you are saying that I like to measure the distance between this point, right? Zero, zero, one. This is zero, zero, one, right? The origin. Yes. And this point. Yes. Yeah, the, in the homogeneous coordinate systems, there are ways of doing it, but you are going to get, I mean, you are going to get, you want to get a skull or something like that. No, you are not going to get it because in homogeneous coordinate system, we don't talk about the lengths. It's Homo not important. Okay. Well, I mean, it is. I, mean, I am saying that it is not, I am not saying that it is not important, it is not possible because homogeneous coordinate systems, the way I introduced you, okay, doesn't talk about the lengths. This is a different world, this is a different space. But that's a good uh, question. Can we say in this world, uh, length is a vector? Uh, no, well, I mean, the way I introduce it to you, no. Length is not a vector. Points are vectors. Lines are vectors. But if you like to measure length, you have to come back to our inhomogeneous coordinate system. Because in this world, okay, there is no difference between perpendicular lines and the parallel lines. Parallelism is not anything other than just two sets of lines. If the length is important and the perpendicularity and the parallelism is important. We talk about the we talk about the in non-homogeneous coordinate system. We talked about the distance between these two parallel lines, right? But in, in homogeneous coordinate system, there is no parallelism. Okay? It is not meaningful. Okay, these are good uh, questions. But uh, I... May I ask a question? Sure. Uh, uh, I, uh, I'm going to... Uh, uh, will we going to uh, talk about the um, real-world problems that helps homogeneous systems as or uh, I understand the mathematical importance but uh, probably I will forget it uh, no 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 I am I, I don't know that's a, fine. that's a very good question I am telling you all these because these have very practical applications the whole open CV library builds on this homogeneous coordinate system okay, okay these these are the fundamentals I, I understand sure, it, sure. Yes. yeah Okay, one, 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 um, one example is this. Let's say I have a camera like that, and along this line, at the infinity, there is a point. Where would the image of that point appear on my image? How are you going to explain that? Okay? Oh, all right. Okay, all you, right, are, you are taking the image of a star. Where does the star appear on my image? Where is the star? The star is at infinity, right? But still, when I take the image of the yeah. star, it appears on my image. So how am I gonna how am I gonna find that equation? These are very important. Or let's say you are in front, you are you are in the middle of two uh, railroad tracks, right? Two parallel tracks. If you take the image of a two parallel tracks. Okay, although they never intersect, they are going to intersect on my image, right? And I should be able to take the, I should be able to take the uh, image of the two, uh, 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 image of the uh, 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 tracks, and at some point, uh, they, they, they should appear as intersecting. So with this kind of stuff, it is okay. going to be very important. It's very clear now. Uh, so I understand that we cannot represent uh, dots uh, in homogeneous system. Is it right or no? No, no. But well, sure, of course. Right. I mean, points and lines are represented using three-dimensional vectors. Both okay, of them. But it, it is not. Uh, it is not a. It won't. It won't be a point actually. Oh, well, yeah, there are infinitely many alternatives to represent a single point, yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. 
Okay, good. Those are good. Okay, let's take let's take ten minutes of break. After the break, maybe I will take your questions again.
Okay, let's continue our discussion of the uh, homogeneous coordinate system. I think somebody was asking a question. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Okay. Uh, in OpenCV library, uh, sometimes um, some functions are uh, faster than faster than uh, mine functions. I wrote the same function with Python language. Um, is if if if, um, is, if OpenCV use this uh, coordinate system, is it make a, a computational power to it? No, no, well, usually, no, I mean, the, the switching to homogeneous coordinate system makes writing those kind of programs more convenient, easier, but computationally you have to do the same thing. Usually, if you are using the Python interface, Python is a very slow language compared to C++, okay? Uh, everything in OpenCV is written using C, C++, and uh, if you are doing some individual pixel-related stuff, and if you have access to the uh, the heap buffer of the pixels with the C and C++, you can use the pointers to iterate over the pixels. That would make it much faster. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's, let's continue. So I think this is the example that I showed you before. Okay. So if I have two lines like this ABC and ABC prime, okay, it looks like that's what we did. Okay, if if I ABC and ABC prime, it looks like they are parallel in non-homogeneous coordinate system. If I do the Cartesian product, cross product of those, I would get B minus A zero. Okay, this is a line, this is a point at infinity, okay. And these are the other stuff. What is my tangent vector and what is my normal direction, etc. So these are ideal points. These are all points in infinity. And how many points are at the infinity? There are infinitely many of them. And they are all at this line. 0, 0, 1 is the line at infinity. Any point that is uh, at infinity should be on this line. Okay on this line. So our our projective space, homogeneous space P2 is whatever we have in R2 in our regular Cartesian coordinate system, non homogeneous coordinate system, plus the points at infinity. Okay. So the homogeneous coordinate system is giving us this part. Points at infinity. That makes a line. You cannot have any point at infinity that is not on this line. All the points that are represented with this line is not in our regular coordinate system. Okay, good. And with the duality with the homogeneous coordinate system, as you have noticed, there is no difference between lines and points in homogeneous coordinate system okay if a point is on a line their multiplication should be zero if a line covers a point their multiplication should be zero if i cross product two lines i would get their intersection point if i cross product two points i would get the line that joins them mm -hmm. This is called duality principle and it is valid when you see a line or when you see a point. So these are all two dimensions. The same extension is possible for three dimensions too. But in three dimensions we don't talk about lines like that. We talk about the planes. Okay. Planes in three dimension. Talking about uh, talking about lines in three dimensions with homogeneous coordinate system is a little bit more complicated. Okay, let's look at this one. A definition. Projectivity. Projectivity is a mapping. Projectivity is a mapping from P2 to itself in homogeneous coordinates, of course. That says, okay, that says 
three points if they are on a line the projectivities are on the on 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 on, on a line too okay so if i have a line x1 x2 x3 their projectivity h x1 h x2 h x3 h is a projectivity okay so i can move from this world to this world using h's i didn't define what h is because we don't know what h is but there is a theorem that says that such a matrix multiplication is a projectivity okay i have a I have a point x1, x1, x2, x3, okay? It's a point, right, in, in, in homogeneous coordinate system. If I multiply this point with this matrix, 3 by 3 matrix, I would get another point, and this transformation is a projectivity. So, so the points on the same line is going to stay points on another line maybe okay on another line and the degree of freedom of this uh, projectivity is eight it is not nine can you tell me why why we say it is eight not nine There are nine numbers in it, so I would expect uh, this projectivity, or specifically we say it is, we say it is homography, okay, is nine degrees of freedom, no it is not, it is eight degrees of freedom. Mm, the last one is probably to make maybe linear or something. Discuss. Say it again, Selman. The last one is what? Maybe to make the transformation linear or something. Uh, I'm just, I was just guessing. Yeah, but I, I'm asking you to guess actually. The last one is something, yeah, that's true. Let's say if this is a uh, projectivity or homography, if I multiply all these numbers with k, what would I get? I would get the same thing, right? It is like k times this and k times that. Because k times a number, a k times a point is the, k times a point is the same thing. Okay, so uh, if I divide all of them, if I divide all of them with h33, h33, I would get the same uh, projectivity. So h33 doesn't matter actually. It is 1. If h33 is 1, then I'm okay. So eight degrees of freedom is enough for projectivity, okay? And what if it's zero? I didn't ask last time, but this time. Uh, if H33 is zero? Another infinite case? No, no, no. Uh, I don't have to do that, okay? What I am saying is that if I am multiplying all of these numbers with K, that means that these numbers are not unique. They are defined up to a scale k, and k could be from minus infinity to plus infinity. Okay. That's why we don't have we don't have uh, nine unique numbers for this projectivity. We have eight unique numbers. That's what I'm saying. Okay, good. And um, the, the same thing. This is this is a very nice picture actually. Let's say I have a point P in the real world. Let's say I have two image planes. One is this pi, the other one is pi prime. If I try to find the image position of this P, okay, if I try to find this image position of this P on this pi, I would find this X. Also, if I try to find the image position of that P on this pi prime, I would find the 
x prime right x prime and the same thing for this r to this this point and r here okay so this is a projectivity this line and this line okay so it keeps the uh, it keeps the being line property uh, i can define a i can define a homography h a 3 by 3 matrix that translates all the points on this pi plane to pi prime plane a, a, a projectivity or homography can do this no problem including the points at infinity any point at infinity that is defined on this image plane pi will be transformed by this homography so that's a nice feature that's a nice feature using this feature maybe i could do this okay this is a picture of a building as you see as you see on this image this rectangle is larger than this rectangle why because of the perspective projection effects because of the perspective projection the the objects that is, that are near to the camera appear larger right that's what the thing but i don't want to do that i don't wanna i don't want to do that what i want to do is what i want to do is i like to have an image where the shapes of shapes of all these windows are equal like this one so what am i gonna do i do this i take these four points point one point three two three four and i know that i know that in an image like that they should map to this point this point this point and this point okay i like to i like to map them to points such that the 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 rectangles of the windows are equal okay so i can do this using a projectivity or h h is a three by three matrix okay and i will i will come up with an h nine numbers in fact eight but i have, i will find nine numbers and these nine numbers will transform each of these pixels from this image to that image including the points at infinity if i have any okay so how would i find those nine numbers okay uh well i mean these correspondences are enough so what am i gonna do these nine numbers h11 h12 h13 21 23 31 32 and h33 and i will get the coordinate of the first one here let's say x1 y1 and w1 or maybe i could say just one right because coordinate system and the other one here is here here is that one it's going to be okay h prime one y prime one and one so i wrote this there are nine unknowns okay how many equations do i need now to find this How many point correspondences do I need to find all those nine numbers? This is one point correspondence. This is one point correspondence. This is another point correspondence. Right? And maybe this is another point correspondence how many points correspondences do i need three. Three, 
is three enough? Uh, well, there are nine unknowns. Or if, if I have a eight degrees of freedom, uh, then uh, eight unknowns because I could accept H3 as one, maybe. Okay? So H11 times X1 plus H12 plus Y1 plus H13 is equal to H1 prime. So I get an equation, right? I get an equation. So one equation from the top line, top line is going to give me an equa equation. This one is going to give me an equation. This one is going to give me an equation, right? So three equations from each point correspondence. Okay. Three equations from each point correspondence. And I need nine I need nine uh, 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 equations. So three points are going to be enough, I guess. Okay. This one says that two constraints per point, four points are needed. If I give four point correspondences, it's going to give me all the equations required for finding all those nine numbers. Okay. Once you have all those nine numbers, I can do this transformation from this image to that image. This is called homography, okay? Homography. Homography works with the... Uh, uh, homography works with the homogeneous coordinate systems and it's very useful to make these kind of transformations. And OpenCV provides you ways of finding homographies. Open CV homography. Let's look at the. Okay, let's look at the homography methods of Open CV. That's the, okay. It's exactly the same thing. I don't know. <coughs> maybe I got these from the Open CV stuff. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Okay. So is homography is very important. It is used for stitching if you like to stitch many images together you find homographies between them this is how it is done okay this is how you do the panoramic image taking right let's say this is your camera this is your image number one how do you take the panorama of a scene you rotate your camera a little bit a little bit a little bit right is that correct Say yes. Okay. Always yes. What do you mean sometimes yes? You take your picture and rotate a little bit, take another one, rotate and take another one. Okay? Once you do that, okay, if you find the homography between this image and that image, if you find the homography between this image and that image, Okay, I would move all of my pixels from that image to that image's space and I would end up an image like that. Okay, that's what this picture says actually. There is a homography between, there is a homography, no, no, here, no, no, I, I didn't say it right. There is a homography between this image and this image. And it is defined by this 3 by 3 matrix. And if you use the homogeneous coordinate systems, finding the homography, the translation, transformation of from one image to the other image is very easy. Can I ask something? Uh, from uh, all these slides uh, pass from the origin, from some point. Uh, so. Uh, actually, we don't have all the 3D space in our uh, projections, right? No, we don't. No, no, no. In this case, it's very special. Why? Because I have the image planes. All the points are in the same. Uh, I, I, I have the image planes. Since they are in the image planes, it is our planner. Okay. I am finding homographies between two planes. Okay. Image plane of the first camera, image plane of the second camera. I don't talk about the 3D. 
because I don't also. get I don't get new 3D information from this one. I am rotating my camera on the same spot. Okay. I am seeing, observing exactly the same 3D world from the same point. I am not getting additional new 3D information. Okay. So, uh, also, uh, homogeneous coordinate system is something similar to this, right? We fix a point and it's like a projection of 3D. Well, I don't understand what you mean by fix a point. Uh, the origin, maybe. Uh, well, or, origin. You have to assume an origin in any in any coordinate system or the uh, uh, representation system. Um, yeah, I was. I, ju I just thought that uh, uh, homogeneous coordinate as a projection of a three D space, but to make no, a no, 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 no. You are making the same error again. Homogeneous okay. coordinates have nothing to do with 3D spaces. Of course, you could use the homogeneous coordinates to represent 3D points. In that case, you would have four-dimensional points. Okay? I mean, you would represent your points using four dimensions. Okay? We are, we are always, now we are all, but this image one and image two, they are all in two-dimensional space. We are talking about two dimensions here. Okay. Uh, previously, I said uh, like homogeneous coordinates are related to homogeneous near equations, but that makes me wrong. So mm, I just want to correct that. Okay. okay. Good. So that's. Uh, I want to ask you. Sure. Uh, in this picture, in, in that building picture, we have a, um, three pictures. Uh, taken from different times. Uh, can we can we do it with uh, reverse processing? And um, we have an image, and we go uh, we go to, uh, we make it like a. Uh, can we make it uh, like a three part image? Um, well, no, actually, all these images are supposed to be taken from the same standing point. You are not changing your position. You are only rotating your camera around the same point. The, your central projection of the camera doesn't change. It is like you have a very large retina. You have a very large image plane, but in fact you don't. So you are, you see this image? This is a very nice image. So you took three images. One image is this. One image is this. The second one is this. And the third one is this. It looks like actually these three are part of this large image. Okay. You are seeing it in a different way. So if I find homographies between these images and the large image, then I can transform from one space to another space. Uh, I want to ask a question. Uh, do we do we use this homogeneous coordinate system uh, to display something with an ang angle? Uh, uh, do I understand this right? Uh, we have an image, and uh, we are we want to display it. We want to display it. Uh, without coordinates, with ang angels, can we do it? Is it using for this? No, well, you could use it for that purpose too, but homogeneous coordinate system makes it very convenient for us to do um, space-based calculations, right? Okay. To be able to stitch these two images, I need to find the correspondences between them. Once I, once I find them, then I can use these homographies to transform images from one position to another position using this, 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 this example here. Once you find all those nine numbers, multiply the position of each pixel with these nine numbers and you would get the new position of the pixel. And I don't have to I don't have to deal with 
if this now if this if this pixel is at the infinity or if this pixel is next to the other one and etc this is just this is just very convenient for me do you remember the, the question you asked me why uh, open cv sometimes behaves very fast well maybe this could be one of the reasons because all you do is just matrix multiplication multiplication maybe you, you could ask your gpu to do this multiplication for you that would make it uh, right if i didn't have this homography available if i am not using the homogeneous coordinate system my calculations would that be wouldn't wouldn't be this linear if it is not linear then i cannot use my gpus i have to write lots of if else code okay Thank you. Any other questions? So let's go back to OpenCV uh, uh, Open uh, documentation. Okay. Camera pose again, uh, we, we are going to talk about it. Again, homographies are used. Oh, this is the same example because it is taken from the very popular book. Again, to stitch. Uh, uh, pictures you would use uh, the same thing and for the camera calibration we use it so let me show you one example of homography homography how we do the homography uh, to find the homography between two images yes okay so this is the function find homography okay let's say I have this image and I have this image and this is a plane and this is another this is the same plane with a different angle right I like to find the homography between these two planes so there is a function in OpenCV that finds the corners of these images okay this one okay here this is a this is a corner here another corner another corner and another corner etc find the same corners here too so there are a total of maybe 40 corners here and 40 corners there and i will say and i will say after finding the corners i know that the corners of the first image correspond to the corners of the second image all i say is that find the homography three by three matrix between these two okay between these two and once i found the uh, homography i can i can transform from one image to another image let's see what they did see do you see the effect trying to make it smaller can't i make it smaller this guy no so i think it transformed from this image no from this image to this image space so their positions are exactly the same so the rest of the image has to be rotated and scaled and i got this right so there is a nice function in opencv that says warp perspective you need to give image one and image two and a homography it does this homography for you okay if you get this image and put this on top of this one exactly you are doing some kind of a image stitching right and the correspondence are there do i do we have any okay do we have any Ooh, no any other examples no okay good okay so homography example is good we did that uh, there are some other examples of homography we are going to come back to this one later well for some reason i am going so 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 slow let me show you this one and after that i will finish up with this uh, today's lecture perspective projection and i think i made up my 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 mind now i am going to give you this stitching stuff image stitching okay good you are gonna take 
three images of your room and you are going to find the homographies between the images and you are going to stitch them together okay you are going to stitch them together and show me the results that will be your first homework image stitching okay panorama stitching and that way you will understand how the homography works I will write it up not today but maybe tomorrow okay remember what we did before we said that given XYZ what would it look like on my image we would say that if your point is XYZ your point in image would be X over Z minus D X over D times D X over Z times D and Y over Z times D minus in front so we could do this using the homogeneous coordinates XYZ is in 3D non-homogeneous coordinate system. I put a 1 and now it's a homogeneous. I have a projection matrix now. 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, minus 1 over D, 0. If I multiply this matrix with this one, I would get, I would get X, Y. How do I get the X? Because this one times x right this one times x 0 times y 0 times z and 0 times 1 it is x right so it is x y and minus z over d so this is a two dimensional point in homogeneous coordinate system how would i take this to non-homogeneous coordinate system you divide x by minus e over d and you divide y by minus e over d if you do that you would get this one as you see i i am doing this calculation of from 3d to 2d using just a simple multi multiplication because of the nice homogeneous coordinate system usage okay so it makes my life a lot easier just a simple matrix multiplication. Question, why do we like matrix multiplications? We like to multiply our vectors with matrices. Why do we like them? Because of linearity. Because of what? Linearity. Linearity. We like things linear. Why do we like things linear? Because we know so much things, so much about it. We know so much about them and we can invert them most of the time, right? And if we know them, okay, we can just do the inver inverse of it. Something like that, okay? Look at this one. If I have a point in, in the real world, three-dimensional point, and if I multiply it with a matrix M, I get a two-dimensional P, okay? matrix right if i uh, th th this is what i'm going to do actually this is very convenient i can multiply all these three dimensional points with these matrices i get to three dimensional points of course in homogeneous coordinates that that's why we like homogeneous coordinates how about this one if i multiply this small p with both sides And this will go away. Would I get this? M minus 1 times small p equals to larger p. So this is in three dimensions and this is in two dimensions. Is this possible? We are going to look at these. So this inversing, inversion of the matrices are very nice. We can do them. And in fact, I can do other stuff. I took an image okay of a point I multiplied with this matrix M then I multiplied with another M so I am taking another image simple matrix multiplication if I multiply this one with this one 
another matrix so it is two times multiplication two times the projection these are very convenient and also we have the gpus right gpus gpus are very good at matrix multiplication so if i am doing this matrix multiplication for all the elements of a 24 million element image then gpu is going to be very useful so we like we like our uh, matrices a lot and we are going to try always express everything in terms of matrix multiplications okay good are there any questions okay then i will see you next week your homework is image stitching using homography See you next week. Thank you. Bye.